Ah, springtime. What a beautiful time of the year. Until you start getting swooped in the head by birds, that is. Well, this guy isn't real or that scary, but you know what I mean. You can risk your life just walking to the shops or to school. But birds aren't swooping you just for the fun of it. They're actually being super caring parents trying to protect their nest or their babies. All parent birds will try to protect their young in some ways. Swans will protect their birds by using their wings or their neck and beak. Even baby swans can climb onto their mum's back to try and protect themselves. Other birds might swoop on things threatening their nest or their babies. Birds like magpies might think we're a threat and swoop on us. Even though they won't actually hit us, there are some things we can do though to protect ourselves. You could just wear a hat or some sunglasses to help protect yourself, but I'm going one step further. I'm making my own super duper anti-swooping, highly protective bird safety hat. Now in order to do this, you just need two things. Firstly, a bike helmet with some holes in it, and secondly, some cable ties. Now all you have to do is tie the cable ties through the holes in the bike helmet. So you want the spiky bits to be coming out through the top of the helmet. The more, the better. Looking good. I think it's a pretty good look for me. If you want a bit of extra protection, now you can add an umbrella to your getup. You might look like the silliest kid in school, but at least you'll be the safest. Later on Get Clever, I'll show you how I make sure baby birds don't lose their way as a wildlife protector. also known as the kitchen, a really small kitchen. Now, there'd usually be more than 60 people on this submarine at any given time, meaning that the chefs would have to cook four meals a day for every single crew member on board for months on end. In the kitchen, the size of my cupboard at home. I can't make you fly, but I can make you the pilot of your very own plane. Now I have tested out a few plane designs and this is definitely my favourite. All you need is a piece of A4 paper. So you can follow on really easily, I've stuck two different colours together, but don't do this at home because you want your plane to be as light as possible. Grab a piece of paper because I'm going to show you how to make the perfect paper plane. Go on, you've got five seconds, go get one. Start by folding the paper in half lengthways. Then open. Fold down the top corners so they are equal with the centre piece. Try and fold as symmetrical and as perfect as you can because this will affect the plane's weight and if it will nosedive. Fold down the top triangle so it makes an envelope and fold the top two triangles down again. Now fold these two little triangles up on either side equally. And then you fold this point here upwards. This will hold your wings in place and balance your plane during flight. Flip it over and fold it in half so your triangles are on the bottom. For the final fold, we're going to create the wings. So just bring the top edge of the paper in line with the nose and the bottom. Flip over and repeat. Ta-da! All done! There are so many different designs of planes out there. Experiment yourself. See what happens if you fold up the wing flaps or have a blunt nose, or if you're inside or outside. But make sure you steer clear from the eyeballs. That pointy tip can do some damage. Happy flying!
This is our Jackie Pixie your pilot. Preparing for landing. Sunny forecast. Watch that. what this tool was used for in ancient Egypt. Not for knitting, or for scratching your back, or for using as chopsticks. It was actually used to pull the brain out through the nasal cavity after somebody passed away in a process called mummification. Ancient Egyptians preserved bodies using mummification. In order to preserve a body, all of the internal organs were taken out, dried, and then preserved in special jars like these ones. And these are called canopic jars, and they're about 3,000 years old. Now, it wasn't just bodies that we found in these tombs. We've also found lots of gold and jewelry. I mean, who wouldn't want to take their bling to the afterlife with them? Now, I'm here at the Nicholson Museum to meet Craig, who's an expert on mummies. Hi, Craig. Hi, Faye. Welcome to the Nicholson. So what kind of people were mummified in ancient Egypt? They tended to be the wealthy, the elite, pharaohs, members of the royal court, wealthy individuals. Why did the ancient Egyptians cover their bodies in salt? Well, part of it was to preserve the body for the afterlife, and so for that you actually needed to remove all of the moisture, all of the liquid from the body. This mummy is really well wrapped up. How do we actually study them without damaging them at all? This is interesting because, of course, with all the bandages and the shrouds, it's difficult to actually see the body of the person inside. And back in the 1850s, when a mummy like this one was first actually excavated out of the ground, it was very, very common for them to be unwrapped and the bandages to be removed. This is not the case today. Today, we tend to use non-destructive, non-invasive techniques of actually understanding what's happening inside the different layers. X-rays, CT scans, I can show you an example of a CT scan of this particular mummy, if you like. Yes, please. Oh, wow. So this is actually the face of uh, the mummy underneath the bandages that you see in front of you. Oh, my goodness. You can see all the teeth and where the nose would have been and the eyes. It means that forensic investigators can actually use this type of, uh, this type of scanning evidence to actually get a much better understanding of who the person was, any diseases that they may have had, um, potentially the causes of death as well. Can you tell how old he was? We can. This particular mummy that we're looking at is a young boy who would have been about seven years of age when he passed away. And he would have lived in the second century AD, so that's around about 1,800 years ago. Amazing. It's really, really extraordinary. These are people who lived all this time ago, but we can learn so much about them. These uh, forensic investigations of uh, the mummified remains can prove things like diets, a history of diseases and medical conditions. So, you know what they had for dinner? In some cases, yeah, that's possible. So, even though we're looking at bodies that are 2,000, 3,000, even 4,000 years old, there's often um, evidence of things like damage to teeth, for example. Egypt being a country surrounded by desert, every time the wind blows, sand would blow into grain, and there's often evidence of wear and tear. So uh, it's very, very interesting just in terms of the types of questions that we asked. Hey, how about showing me this experiment? Well, one of the interesting things is, of course, the entire process of embalming, where the um, embalmers would actually wrap the bodies up in bandages. Here, hold this for a second. OK. Uh, Craig? Craig? A little bit of help here, please. I think I'm a bit stuck. Mummy? Mummy, help! Help! This is a periscope, and there's actually two on board a submarine, and it was the submarine's link to the world above the water. Now, how they actually work is they extend up out of the submarine, and using mirrors, it allows the crew to see if it's safe to surface. Earlier on Get Clever, we talked about why birds swoop. Aside from spring being the time an adult bird swoop to protect their young, it also means flying school time. Yep, baby birds have to learn how to flap their wings so they can leave the nest and fend for themselves. But learning how to fly sometimes means falling first and landing on the ground. 
Now it's really important if you do see a baby bird on the ground, also known as the fledgling, not to pick it up. You might think it needs rescuing, but its parents think differently. Just like humans, babies need to learn how to crawl and how to walk. And the same thing is for birds. They need to learn how to flap their wings and how to forage for food as well. So if you see a baby bird, just leave it to figure out all these things for itself. And usually its parents are around keeping a safe eye on it. Sometimes in my job as a volunteer wildlife rescuer, I might come across a baby bird on the ground. If it doesn't look like its parents are around, then what I can do is make a fake nest for it where it can wait while its parents come back. I'm gonna grab some stuff to make the nest. So what I need for my fake bird's nest is some cable ties, some coconut fiber, my baby bird Stevie, and importantly, a empty ice cream container. Now in your ice cream container, I'm gonna need two holes at the front to connect it to a branch, and also some holes on the bottom so that if it does rain, my fake bird nest doesn't flood. What I then need to do is tie my ice cream container to a nice low branch so I can see the baby bird when he's inside. And then you can add your coconut fiber. And last but not least, put in my baby bird Stevie. And there he is, nice and cozy while he waits for his parents to come back. Just remember, if you do come across a baby bird on the ground, don't touch it or move it. If you do find any animals that need help, you can contact a wildlife rescue organisation like the one I'm a part of to come and help these little guys out. that this water park float down the slide and that's what makes them so much fun. So it's inspired me to make my very own bath toys. Let's see if they float. My first test is cardboard. A boat made of cardboard will absorb the water. The boat will become heavier and more dense than the surrounding water and will sink. Second up, a dishwashing sponge. It will float, but will over time absorb the water and eventually sink. And last but not least, aluminium. We'll make aluminium foil boats, or rather, little foil balls. This one actually shows the density relationship to the buoyant force exerted by the water. Start with a large ball, then squish it smaller and smaller. <laughs> Eventually, when the density of the ball is higher than that of the water, the ball will sink. A big ball will float and a small ball will sink, even though we use the same amount of foil. So it's all about the density of the ball. I know how to make bar toys now, but what about something that will hold me? I love swimming, but sometimes you just need a break, you know? Ah, a boogie board. Perfect. Thanks. Boogie boards are made out of different types of foam and gaskets trapped in that foam, that's what makes it buoyant. This boogie board looks perfect to take a spit on the water slide. See ya! Space. The final frontier. But is there anybody actually out there? I don't think there's anyone else out there in space. I don't think aliens exist in space. I do think aliens exist because I've seen aliens on the news. Aliens. Do they really exist? Maybe. Or don't they? I don't think aliens exist. So, what would they look like if they did arrive on Earth? Maybe they're already among us. Excluding the robot ones, no. There might be aliens on Earth because they could be underground or in caves. And where will they come from? 
I think the aliens would come from Mars. I guess aliens would come from Mars. I think aliens will live on Mars. What will they wear? And they would have different clothing to us, like rainbow jackets that are made out of stars or something. Giraffe heads, green body, um, weird mouth and their eyes like here and one here. How will they travel? In a giant mothership. In a big space rocket. If aliens would come to Earth, I think they would travel by aeroplane. Hmm. So should I be afraid of them? Or should I be excited to meet them? If I saw an alien, I would be pretty scared. Do you reckon that you'd get on with one if you were to meet one? I wouldn't be scared if I saw an alien, but I still wouldn't go and say hello. If you did meet an alien, what would be the first thing you want to tell them about Earth? If I saw an alien, I would be scared because they have big eyes, long fingers, and they would... They're not friendly people. Do you know what this is? That looks like a rock. I think that looks like a big rock. A lump of clay. Um, I think it's uh, the rocks that float around in space. This is a meteorite. It's a rock from outer space. And scientists like me think that if aliens were to arrive on Earth somehow, this is probably how they would get here. And we think that if alien life does exist, it's probably more likely to look more like this. That doesn't look like anything like an alien. It looks like a big gooey jelly bean. It looks is like that coral. cauliflower? Is it coral? It's, it's, is that That's cauliflower? Coral. It looks like... Is that cauliflower? It's no. coral. Coral. So there you have it. Aliens might not be quite as scary as you think. You know, NASA's big concern is actually Earth sending our own aliens, or our own bacteria, to other planets. That's why NASA heavily sanitizes anything before they send it off into space. As I mentioned before, there was usually more than 60 people on the sub at any given time, but there definitely wasn't 60 bunks to sleep in. This is because they had to sleep in shifts, because someone always had to be running the sub. Now these things are quite a tight squeeze as you can see, and they even had seat belts. Hi, my name's Rob Brabber, and I'm the operations manager here at Eureka Skydeck, and this is the tallest building in Melbourne. The tower was built in 2006. It took just over four years to complete, with a budget of just over $500 million. It was the tallest tower in the uh, Southern Hemisphere. Now, the tower can sway up to 30 centimetres either side, and that is counterbalanced by 300,000 litre water tanks up on level 91. The tower is 92 storeys tall, uh, with residents all the way up to level 87, and the Eureka Skydeck on level 88. As the building can sway up to 30 centimetres, the water tanks can uh, counterbalance and sort of sway to one side, and that sort of evens up the building. I've been here for over 10 years, and I've only ever really felt the building sway once. The Edge is the first glass box that was ever built in the world. Uh, so it starts inside the building, and it protrudes out by three metres. Now, the glass that we're standing on is only four and a half centimetres thick, so it's very safe. It can, uh, it can take up to 10 tonne, uh, so many elephants can fit in here. The way the edge works is actually quite a simple invention. So it screws out, uh, it kind of levers out, and then with the glass, it's actually four little panels of glass with a uh, eyeglass feature in the middle, and that's what makes it flash on and off. When you step into the edge, you cannot see anything, so it's all opaque, and then we'll press a button, and it will slowly move out. Now, as you move out, there's all different sound effects like cracking glass. And then once you're fully out, you know, you hear this sort of silence a little bit and then this bang, crashing noise. And then you look down and it's the biggest fright because you can see all the way down and just watching cars right underneath your feet. 